I can hear you, and at this time, the V2R1 Exchange and New Era Software proudly present today's speaker, Greg Boyd. Greg. Thanks, Jerry, and, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, and again, I'd like to thank New Era for uh, giving us this opportunity to get together and talk about the crypto capabilities on System Z. Uh, as Jerry described in the opening, um, in January we did the intro to crypto, and then last week we started talking about the hardware, and hopefully we'll wrap things up this uh, month uh, on the hardware. And then in March and April we'll do uh, a two-part session on ICSF and, and what it brings to the table in terms of the, the crypto infrastructure. And then in June we'll talk about master key entry. And a lot of what we'll talk, or not a lot, but some of what we'll talk today is kind of preliminary to that. So uh, hopefully you'll, you've been able to follow along and keep up with these sessions. Um, and on slide two, that kind of repeats what I just said. Uh, I am going to start with a couple of refresher slides because I'm not going to assume that uh, everybody was able to make the earlier calls. But we'll, we'll go quickly through those refreshers and, and get to the meat of the pre presentation. Again, last month we talked about hardware. Uh, we focused on the, the CPACF, the CP Assist for Cryptographic Function. This month we're going to focus in on the Crypto Express cards and, and what they bring to the table, and including taking a look at some of the configuration that uh, you need to do to get the crypto cards uh, available to your LPARs. So we'll go to slide three. Uh, again, kind of a refresher. You've seen this in both of the first two sessions. In terms of crypto capabilities, there's actually a, a number of different functions that cryptography brings to the table, uh, that cryptography provides that can help you uh, run and secure your business. Uh, you know, at the top there, we have data confidentiality. That's what everybody thinks of when they think of cryptography. Taking data, uh, taking clear text data and scrambling it, turning it into cipher text that, that effectively looks like uh, garbage. There's two different types of um, data confidentiality algorithms. There are symmetric algorithms and asymmetric algorithms. Uh, with a symmetric algorithm, both parties, both the encryptor, the person creating the cipher text, and the decryptor, the, the person that's recovering the clear text, um, must have access to the same key value. So the key is the same on both ends of the operation. Uh, on this chart we mentioned uh, DES and triple DES and AES. Those are the symmetric algorithms that we support on the crypto hardware. Uh, there's actually a bunch of other symmetric algorithms available, um, some of which we support in software, but those, uh, these two, uh, triple DES and AES, are the ones that are supported on hardware. The asymmetric algorithms, on the other hand, they rely on two different but mathematically related key values. Um, that is the, the concept of a public-private key. A public key I can share with uh, everyone on the call. Each of you can encrypt a message with my public key and send me that ciphertext, and only I can decrypt it with my, my corresponding private key. Even though uh, somebody else on the call has a copy of my public key, they cannot decrypt your message with that public key. It can only be done with the private key. Similarly, I could encrypt a message with my private key, and I could send it to everyone on this call, and every one of you would be able to decrypt my message. Now, that's not really providing a lot of security, but it does provide some authenticity. You know that that message had to come from me, because you're decrypting it with my public key or the public key that's associated with me. There's actually three different types of asymmetric algorithms. There's RSA, Diffie-Hellman, and elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, we talked a little bit about those in the introductory session in January. Um, those are the, the algorithms that we support in the IBM crypto hardware. Now, going on from data confidentiality, we have data integrity, and there's a couple different facets of integrity. Uh, there's the concept of modification detection. Can you tell that a message you received from me has been changed? Uh, did, the, you know, did a bit get dropped uh, either accidentally or even deliberately? Can, can you determine when that happens? And cryptography uses a function called hashing to, to uh, provide that modification detection. Message authentication takes hashing a step farther and actually introduces a key into that hashing process. 
And if you and I are, are sharing a key value and introduce the same key into that hashing algorithm, we should come up with the same message authentication code. And if we do, then you can have some confidence that not only did the message not change, but it had to come from me or it had to come from the partner that you're sharing that key with. Non-repudiation is the idea of can I deny having submitted or authorized a transaction? So if I uh, use a website to order a product and I provide my credit card information and, and uh, want the business to uh, charge my credit card, they obviously don't want me to be able to come back later and say that I did not authorize that transaction. And some of the cryptographic algorithms can help with that idea of non-repudiation so that they can have confidence that, that I can't deny a transaction once it's been submitted. Financial functions, the, the third bullet there on slide three, uh, uh, has to do with ATM pin processing, uh, the ability to uh, protect and secure uh, pins associated with credit cards so that there's security around that process. And um, when we talk about the Crypto Express cards today, those Crypto Express cards are where we provide that financial pin functionality because there's some special security requirements around that. And then the, the fourth bullet on the page is key security and integrity. Um, this is the idea of can you have confidence in your key material that A, they are protected, and B, that they haven't been changed or compromised uh, while they're in storage and, and while they're required. Um, you're not going to go create a crypto system or a crypto environment just to manage keys. But I will suggest to you that the, the security and integrity of your key material is critical to the crypto infrastructure. And if you don't have that security, your crypto environment is going to break down. So those, those functions are what we're going to see are available in the cryptographic hardware as we go through the presentation today. On slide Four, I want to talk about some terminology. Um, historically, the IBM hardware has been defined as either clear key hardware or secure key hardware. And if you go back even to before cryptographic hardware was available, uh, you could implement these algorithms in software. You could have subroutines that uh, did the multiplication, did the bit uh, shifting to, to implement a DES or an AES algorithm. And when you were doing it in software, by definition, your keys were in the clear. That is, they were uh, either hard-coded into the program or maybe provided as input to the program. But if you had a key value of ABCD, um, there was a variable in the program that said, my key equals ABCD. And if anybody could take a dump of the address space, they could potentially see that key value in the dump. The I, the IBM hardware that's defined as clear key hardware expects to receive the key material in the clear. That is, if you're using a value of ABCD as your key, then you must pass that ABCD to the, the clear key hardware, which we saw last month was the CP Assist for cryptographic function. Now, ICSF provides some protection in that that variable or that key value will exist inside the ICSF address space, which is a, a, a ZOS started task. So there's some additional protection. Not just anybody can dump that address space. But the bottom line is that the clear key hardware expects to see your key in the clear. Secure key hardware, on the other hand, provides some additional protection for your key material. We're going to see in a couple slides that the Crypto Express cards are uh, what we call an HSM, a hardware security module. And that is they have some tamper resistant technology built in that will detect when an attack is made on the hardware and will respond or, or react to that uh, attack. And we'll see that the way things work is inside that tamper resistant boundary, that key value of ABCD will be in the clear. But if, we, if the key leaves the hardware, let's say we want to store a copy for uh, use later you know, next month or next week or whatever, before we let that key material leave the secure tamper resistant boundary, we'll encrypt it under another key called the master key. So the Crypto Express card is our HSM. It's our hardware security module. It provides that tamper resistant technology. 
Now, the new kit on the block is protected key. That's kind of a hybrid between the two. It uh, takes advantage of the strengths of, of both devices. It uh, uses the security of the, the uh, Crypto Express card, the HSM, to protect the key material, but it will also rely on the speed of the CPACF to perform some of the cryptographic operations. And, and we'll come back and talk about that a little bit later when we uh, look at how the, uh, the Crypto Express card is installed. So with that, let's go to slide five. Uh, this is another slide that we saw last month. And uh, again, last month we focused kind of on the left, the lower left part of this screen, the CP Assist for cryptographic function. Uh, that's the clear key hardware that comes with the Keck. Uh, when you order a ZEC12, uh, the CPACF is there. It's available whether you want to use it or not. Uh, there is some microcode that has to be installed to enable it but uh, it comes with the machine at no additional charge. Uh, this month we're going to talk about the, the PCI cards, the Crypto Express cards, which are installed out in the I.O. cage on the, the Z196s and earlier. Uh, it's now installed in the I.O. drawer on the, the ZEC12. But these are installed out or, uh, on the self-timed interrupt, so they're out in this I.O. cage, and that has uh, an impact on performance, and, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, we implemented, we started implementing this technology on the Z800 and the Z900, and then really embraced it, uh, starting with the Z890 and 990, and it's continued on since then. There, there were some significant advantages in moving this technology out to the I.O. cage or the I.O. drawer. Um, first of all, there was the issue of availability. If you implemented this cryptographic function as part of the base CPU, as, as part of the motherboard, if you will, that would mean every time you needed to make a change to the technology, it would require an outage of the machine to, to install the new microcode and, and get the, the, uh, the new functionality installed. By moving the function to the I.O. cage, you can dynamically install a card at any time. And if we come out with a new card with new functionality, you can just order that card slap it into the hardware without an outage of the uh, Keck, without an outage of the LPAR, without even an outage of ICSF, and make that functionality available. Uh, you can add them dynamically, so ICSF will kind of, when you slide the card in, will kind of respond with, oh, I've got some new hardware here. I will start taking advantage of it. And if you have a version of ICSF that will exploit that technology, then you are uh, immediately up and running. So it provides some significantly improved availability for the technology. The other way, area where it helped is with uh, scalability. Um, when you order a Crypto Express card, we're going to see in a minute that you must order a minimum of two for redundancy. So if you start with the minimum, if you install two of the Crypto uh, Express engines, you'll have a certain amount of capacity for that crypto work. And as the work grows, if you start pushing the limits of those two engines, you can order another engine from IBM and again, slap it in and dynamically it will be available and you will have the additional capacity. And you can, ex we'll see in a little bit that you can install up to 16 engines. So you can grow from no Crypto Express cards all the way up to 16 uh, engines. And, uh, for example, when, when we talk about performance, we'll, we'll get into a lot more detail. But with no Crypto Express cards, you can perform approximately 1,200 to 1,500 SSL handshakes per second using software technology, using those subroutines that implement an RSA uh, algorithm. Um, the Crypto, a Crypto Express 4S, uh, on the other hand, can handle about 5,000 of those operations per second. So you can go from being able to support uh, about 12 to 1,500 handshakes per second in software up to installing two Crypto Express engines. You can uh, support about 10,000. And if you fully populate the, the I.O. cage and put all 16 engines, you get up to about 80,000 transactions per second that you can support on the Keck. So there's a tremendous amount of scalability uh, with the Crypto Express cards. 
And then the, the third area that the, the cards help, or having the cards in the I.O. cage help is, as you can imagine, it's certainly a lot easier to build that tamper-resistant boundary and capsulize it within the Crypto Express card as opposed to drawing, trying to build that secure ta uh, boundary around the CPU itself and around the, the chips that are installed in the motherboard. So it helped us control the cost of this technology and being able to provide that protection. So there's some pretty significant benefits to moving it out to the, the I.O. cage. The downside, however, is it's installed in the I.O. cage, so you're effectively doing an I.O. operation every time you want to perform cryptographic work on the cards. Uh, ICSF will have to hand the work over to the cards, and that's an asynchronous operation, so other work can be going on in the CPU, but ICSF and your application will have to wait for the card to finish the work and then hand it back over to ICSF. So one of the big differences between the CPAC-F and the Crypto Express cards are the performance expectations. The CPAC-F will be much faster. Uh, the Crypto Express cards are, are slower, and it's not so much slower in processing, but that overhead of handing the work over and then getting it back. And that can have some performance impact, uh, especially when you're looking at things like database access. Um, the databases don't like to wait for those operations to complete. So that's a consideration as you're implementing the technology. So with that, Let's go to slide six. Uh, this provides a little bit of history in terms of uh, the current technology is the Crypto Express 4 S card. Prior to that, we had the Crypto Express 3, which was supported on the Z10s, the Z196, and, and is also supported on the EC12s. And then prior to that, we had the Crypto Express 2 cards, which were supported on the 890 and the Z990, as well as the Z9 and the Z10. Now, the Crypto Express 2 and the Crypto Express 3, the standard configuration, when you ordered a Crypto Express feature, it came with two engines automatically, two cryptographic engines that are basically identical. Uh, again, you had to order two features for redundancy. So the minimum order on the, the EC, the Enterprise class machines, was four engines. You, you you didn't have to order Crypto Express cards, in which case you had none. But if you wanted the feature, you had to order two of the features and get four of the engines. Now, we did have the 1P or the 1 processor models. Uh, they were um, only supported on the business class machines. And, and the reason was that the, the Crypto Express cards were fairly expensive. Um, and as a, a, a portion of the KEC procurement, um, the cards could almost be as expensive as some of the smaller business class machines. So we came out with the 1P model to, to give you a lower price entry point. But again, you had to order at least two of those features, um, and they would be installed on different sides of the KEC so that if one side failed, you would still have to uh, access to the crypto card on the other side. Now, with the Crypto Express 4S, um, the, the way it was installed changed because now on the ZEC12 and the BC12, we have the I.O. drawer instead of the I.O. cage. And we changed it so that there, the Crypto Express 4S only comes in a single engine mod, uh, feature. So if you order a Crypto Express 4S, you only get one engine on the card. And, and frankly, I think that was a good decision. Uh, that provides a lot better granularity. Um, if you were exceeding the capacity of the cards that you had installed, instead of having to buy a Crypto Express 3 with two engines and you know, increase the capacity uh, you know, with twice as many engines, now you can grow at a little bit more granular rate. So it gives you a little bit more control over the procurement process and, and uh, uh, the process of adding new engines and new capacity. Um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to mention. Oh, I, again, you can order, you can install up to 16 engines. So if you're running on a Z, EC12 with Crypto Express 3 cards, you could have at most 8 features or 16 engines. On the Crypto uh, Express 4S on the EC12, you can order at most 16 of the features to get 16 engines. 
that is subject to other things that are installed in the I.O. cage or the I.O. drawer. Uh, if you fully populated your I.O. drawer with OSA cards or other PCI devices, you may not be able to get the full 16, but um, as long as you're managing that and keeping the, those other cards down to a reasonable level, you can grow to up to 16 different engines um, on your um, cat. On slide 7, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, this kind of a gee whiz, some of the technology uh, around the card. Uh, again, um, you see there in the bottom right corner that, that there's a secure boundary there. So um, this is the tamper-resistant boundary. Uh, we'll talk on the next slide a little bit more about what that provides, but uh, the card will react if somebody tries to access the key material inside the card, and it will respond to it and wipe the material out. Now, within the Crypto Express uh, feature, there are multiple cryptographic engines. There are engines that do DES and triple DES encryption. There are other engines that do AES encryption. There's other engines that do RSA and ECC. So, in reality, you can get multiple operations going against the card. Uh, the triple DES engine could be encrypting using triple DES while the RSA engines are doing RSA work. And while that's all going on, um, one of the other engines might be generating some random numbers that you can use as uh, key material. Now, for the, the DES and triple DES engines, there, one of the neat capabilities there is there's actually multiple engines on the card. And when you send a, a, a DES or triple DES operation to the card, will actually drive it through at least two in will drive it through two engines in parallel and then we'll compare the results from the two engines at the end of the operation and if they compare then we have some confidence that the the operation completed successfully and we'll return the results back to you if for some reason there's a problem in the card and one of the engines generates a different response a different answer the card will recognize that and say, you know, there's something wrong here. The card will issue a check and, uh, you know, we'll go through error recovery to get that back to you. But the point is, we're not going to let you encrypt bad data and store that somewhere because two weeks later when you come back and try and decrypt that data, if there was a bit dropped or something changed, you're not going to be able to recover your original clear text. Um, the RSA engines also have multiple uh, engines on the card. We don't do compare operation because these are very fairly expensive operations, but what we can do is if the card is capable and if the card is not running hot, we will bring additional RSA engines online so you can drive more work to the card. So we'll see again on the next slide that one of the tamper resistant uh, capabilities, one of the things that we monitor is the temperature of the card because if the temperature fluctuates uh, that could be used as an attack vector and if the card gets too hot it will shut itself down. As long as it's not running too hot we can bring additional RSA engines on and drive more work through the card so you can get more offer RSA operations done uh, at any single point in time. Um, there's battery backup RAM uh, on the card. We're going to see a little bit later that we store master keys inside that tamper resistant boundary. So if for some reason the power goes out and there's no power to the keck, we've got these batteries in there that will maintain the volatility of those master keys in the registers. So that's all done inside that tamper resistant boundary. The, the capabilities are there so to make sure you don't lose that master key material. Um, down in the bottom left, you know, there's a that USB and serial port. Uh, the cards actually do have a USB and a serial interface, but they are not accessible on system on the System Z hardware. Uh, the the Crypto Express card is built on the 4765 processor chip. That technology is available for other platforms like the power systems. Um, and on those power systems, you can access the card through the USB or the serial port, but on System Z, we do not allow you to access that. So your CE can't plug into the card and be looking at what's going on inside the card so that we provide that additional protection uh, on System Z. 
Um, I think oh, the, the other point on the card, and, and we'll see this again a little bit later, the 4765 implements the common cryptographic architecture, the CZA, uh, and on the Crypto Express 4S specifically, we also uh, support PKCS 11 architecture as well. So let's go to slide eight, uh, which talks about the tamper detection. Um, I talked about the temperature. Uh, we'll monitor the temperature, and if it gets too hot or too cold, uh, that uh, can cause a, 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 an interrupt. The card will recognize that as an attack. Um, we've had uh, cases where the a customer ordered a Crypto Express card. We ship it in special uh, environmentally controlled packaging. But in at least one case, a, CA, a CE has taken it out of the package, stuck it on the, the uh, windowsill, and when the afternoon sun hit it and warmed it up, the car <laughs> detected that as an attack. It just got too hard and, or too hot, and the car zeroized itself and basically turned itself into a brick uh, because the, the temperature is one of the things that it monitors. Um, the card is actually uh, you know, installed on a circuit board that's wrapped in a wire mesh. That mesh is sealed with an epoxy, and then the whole package is uh, put inside of a medical, metal canister. So if somebody drills through that metal canister and tries to drill through that mesh and that epoxy and to put a probe on the card, uh, that'll cause a circuit break on the card, and it will say, you know, something's going on here that's not right, and it will wipe itself out before it'll let it be compromised. Uh, there's also power sequencing, so if you fluctuate the voltage that's coming to the card, uh, there's certain attacks that can be mounted if you can manipulate the voltage. So we'll look for that, and if that's detected, we'll wipe the card out. And, and basically what happens when a, a tamper is detected, uh, the first thing it'll do is it'll wipe out the key material. It'll zeroize those registers where the master keys are stored so they cannot be uh, pulled out of the card. And the, the effect of all of this is that card becomes basically useless. It's permanently inoperable once uh, a tamper uh, response uh, has been made. It will wipe itself out. It's not going to let your data, your key material, uh, be compromised. And all of this is, uh, meets the FIPS 140-2 level 4 uh, requirements, which are the highest level of, of security for a cryptographic module. On slide 9, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the capabilities within the card. Um, we're going to see on the next slide that by default, when you, when you install a Crypto Express card, it's configured as what we call a coprocessor. And when it's configured as a coprocessor, it can support everything on this slide except that last bullet, the secure key PKCS11. So when you're configured as a coprocessor, the card will do secure key encryption using either DES, triple DES algorithms, or AES algorithms. Those are the same algorithms that are supported on the CPAC-F hardware, the same triple DES and AES algorithms. The difference is the protection of the key material. On the CPAC-F, if you've got a key value of ABCD, you pass ABCD to the CPAC-F. On the Crypto Express card, if your key material is ABCD, what actually happens is you, uh, when you create the key and store the key of ABCD, it's first encrypted under that master key, and that ciphertext is stored outside the card. When you perform the operation, we'll bring that ciphertext in, then inside the cryptographic card, we'll decrypt it from underneath the master key, recover the value of ABCD, and then perform the encryption or decryption operation on the data that you want to protect. Uh, the financial pin functions, that's the technology where um, we can protect and, and it's compliant with many of the banking regulations in terms of how you protect customer pins. Uh, the, the four digits that you enter when you go up to your ATM and try to get money out. There, there are a number of restrictions on how that technology must work, how the, that those pins must be protected, and we implement those standards inside the Crypto Express card. Uh, the Crypto Express card can generate random numbers, uh, and now it can, uh, 
can generate long random numbers, which are 8096 bits or, maybe, or even longer. Random number generation is important because random numbers make good key material. If you can't guess the key and it's protected inside all of this secure technology, that provides a high level of security. So we can generate random numbers and then within the card in that previous bullet, we can manage those keys and we, we can create those keys and the keys that map to the CCA architecture that can be stored out in your repositories. Um, with the Crypto Express 3 on the, the Z10 and going forward to the Crypto Express 4S, um, the Crypto Express card participates in that new uh, protected key capability. That key that uh, it starts life as a secure key encrypted under the master key, but then we can uh, decrypt it and rewrap it in a way that the CPAC F hardware can use and provide better performance uh, for your operations. And then finally, the, the coprocessor can also perform RSA and elliptic curve operations that public-private key operations that are very expensive in software. Um, we support those on the Crypto Express card. They are not supported on the CPAC F hardware. Those are typically used in SSL handshakes, and so the cards can provide a significant performance boost over software. Now, the last bullet on there, Secure Key PKCS 11 support, that's um, uh, fairly new. That's new with the Crypto Express 4S. If you configure the card in coprocess or in PKCS 11 mode, that's all it can do is PKCS 11 operations. Um, so that's some specific functionality that has to be properly configured. And we'll come back and talk about that configuration and that setup a little bit later on. Um, slide 10 actually talks about those two modes or those three modes. So again, coprocessor modes, you have all of the functionality that was on that previous chart except the PKCS 11 mode. Um, when you use the card as a coprocessor, you must first have a master key loaded. That kind of enables everything else. Um, and having that master key loaded means that key material can be created and then securely stored outside of the card for later use. I mentioned on the previous slide that the coprocessor also supports those SSL handshakes. You can also configure the card as an accelerator and when you do, the card can only support those SSL handshakes. It can only perform a public key encrypt, a public key decrypt, or a digital signature verify. And all of those operations are associated with system SSL and the handshake phase of system SSL where the two parties authenticate and negotiate how they're going to handle the rest of the, the transaction. So when you're configured as a coprocessor, there's a tremendous amount of functionality there. You can do secure key encryption, you can do PIN operations, you can do SSL operations. When you're configured as an accelerator, you can only do SSL operations, but you can do a lot of them. Uh, again, the Crypto Express cards can handle five to 6,000 handshakes per second when configured as an accelerator. If the card is configured as a coprocessor, it can still do those handshakes, but it can only do about 1,000 to 1,200 operations per second. So it might be able to do 300 triple DES operations and 300 AES operations and 300 random number generates and 300 SSL operations. So the throughput is, is much lower, but you get a lot more functionality when you're configured as a coprocessor. With the accelerator, limited functionality, but, but uh, highly optimized performance for those three SSL operations. And then again, when you're, uh, as I mentioned before, when you're configured in EP11 mode, you want to support PKCS11 operations. Um, the card is configured in PKCS11 mode. It cannot do any of the CCA functionality at that point. It can only do PKCS11 operations. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about what PKCS means, uh, PKCS11 means in a later slide. So I think that's what I wanted to cover on this slide. Let's go to slide 11. 
Um, I mentioned on the previous slide that uh, when it's configured as a coprocessor, it supports UDXs. A UDX is a user-defined extension, and, and basically what a UDX does is it gives you the ability to insert your own customized code inside that tamper-resistant boundary of the card. The best example I can give you of a UDX is some stuff that customers are doing with pin operations. Once again, those pins are the, the pin that you enter at your ATM machine. The federal regulations require that all pin processing must be done inside of a hardware security module, a tamper-resistant technology. So what happened was, we, you know, we had some customers that, you know, we, we provide the, the basic pin support. We provide the, the APIs to, to meet the Visa or the Amex standards, whatever they are. Um, but, you know, some of the banks wanted to be able to distinguish themselves from their competitors. So one of the things they would do is, you know, if, if we don't let customers use weak pins, we can advertise ourselves as being stronger or, or more secure than our competitors. So what a bank might do is they might say, well, we're not going to let customers use a pin value of 1111 or 2222. And what they did was they would implement a UDX, which was some additional code that would check and see, is the customer pin 1111? And if it was, then they would return a, a, a return code back to the application that said, you're trying to use a weak pin. We're not going to let you do that. You need to change to a stronger pin. Because we're doing those compares and those checks of the, the, the clear pin value, it must be done inside the tamper-resistant boundary of the card. And we would implement that using a UDX. So the customer would provide the, the logic, if you will, of what they wanted to check for. And then we would implement that and give them the, the code that they would install back inside the UD or inside the Crypto Express card as a UDX. Now, you know, the first customer did this, and then another customer came along a little bit later and said, you know, we're going to one up them, and instead of just checking for 1111 and one two, or 2222, we're also going to check for 1234 and 9876. So each, each organization could have their own unique UDX that gets installed inside the tamper resistant boundary of the card. Now, you should be aware, um, on System Z, the only way to create a UDX is to work with IBM, uh, to contract with IBM to implement that code for you. And you should be aware that the UDX is specific to the card and the version of ICSF. So if you upgrade cards, if you switch from a Crypto Express 3 to a Crypto Express 4S, or if you upgrade versions of ICSF, if you go from HCR 7790 to HCR 77 Able 1, that UDX will probably have to be tweaked a little bit because control blocks will change from hardware to hardware and from ICSF to ICSF. So it's kind of like a local mod, a user exit, which a lot of customers are trying to get rid of, but you do have the capability inside the Crypto Express card uh, to support this thing called a UDX and, and this custom code. So I'm going to pause there while I take a drink, but then we're going to go to slide 12. Uh, this slide is a little bit more about the, the PKCS11 mode. Uh, PKCS11 is an architecture that was developed by RSA Labs, uh, Rivesh Shamir and Edelman. Those were the guys that originally came up with um, public-private key algorithms. And PKCS11 is basically a standard for holding and working with uh, cryptographic information that's moving around and being passed to cryptographic modules, a module being an HSM like the Crypto Express card or maybe like a smart card with a crypto chip in it. And PKCS11 is like uh, another version of CCA, IBM's Common Cryptographic Architecture, defines how we deal with and manipulate cryptographic material. PKCS11 is just a slightly different standard that accomplishes the same thing and defines how you deal with cryptographic modules. So PKCS11 is an architecture that was developed by RSA. 
we have actually supported, uh, as you'll see on slide 13, we've supported PKCS 11 in software for a number of years. But again, with the software implementation, uh, your key material is in the clear. Your key material gets passed to the software routines. Now, uh, the software might use the CPACF hardware or it might use the Crypto Express cards, but that key material could potentially pass in the clear. With the Crypto Express 4S and with the EP11 mode, what we've done is given you the ability to use secure keys within that PKCS11 architecture. So just like with CCA, there's an EP11 master key. When you create a PKCS11 key and want to store it outside the cryptographic hardware, that will be encrypted under a master key and eventually stored in your TKDS or your token key data, data set with the, the key material encrypted under the, the uh, EP11 master key. So your PKCS11 key material does not exist in the clear anywhere except inside of that secure hardware. Uh, the PKCS11 uh, uh, services have been updated. They're smart enough to know. Look, they'll look at the key material that you reference. They'll look at some of the flags that are stored with it and know whether you're dealing with a clear key or a secure key. And then we'll route the work appropriately either to the CPACF hardware, to other software routines, or to the, uh, the Crypto Express 4S that's configured in PKCS11 or in an EP11 mode. On slide 14, let's talk a little bit more about master keys. It's important to realize that the only place your master keys exist are inside that secure tamper-resistant boundary of the card. We're going to see in a minute a little bit about how that works. But the implication here is when you load a master key and you put it inside the card, it's available to that card and that keck. If you have a disaster and have to fall back and move to a DR site, you are going to have to be able to bring that key material over to the DR site. And we'll talk a lot more about that when we talk about master key entry uh, a little bit later on in the year. Now, with the, with the Crypto Express 4S and the EP11 mode, there are now five different master keys that you can load into the hardware. Um, there's the DES master key, which is used to protect DES or triple DES operational keys. So if you want to create a 24-byte DES key that you're going to use to encrypt your data, and you define it as a secure key, before that key material leaves the, the tamper-resistant boundary of the card, it'll be encrypted under the master key. Now, prior to the Crypto Express 4S, the DES master key was 16 bytes long. But we now have support to, uh, uh, for a 24-byte DES master key that provides better security for your DES and triple DES keys. The AES master key is used to protect AES keys. So if you create an AES key with a value of ABCD before it gets stored in the repository, it will be encrypted using an AES algorithm and a 256-bit AES master key. For asymmetric keys and elliptic curve keys, you know, they, they have a public-private key pair. There's a public key and a private key that are associated together. If you have a public key, we won't encrypt that. A public key is going to get published to the public. So we don't worry about encrypting those. But your private key that's associated with that public key, you're the only one that ever needs to use that. You're the only one that ever needs access to it. When you create a private key, we will encrypt that either under an RSA master key for the RSA private key or under an elliptic curve master key for the elliptic curve private key. So the key material that gets stored out in your PKDS, the private keys are encrypted under the appropriate master key. And then finally, the EP11 uh, master key is used to encrypt those PKCS11 key material that will be stored out in your token key data set. Let's go to slide 15. Um, for each of those keys, there are actually multiple copies of the key or multiple uh, places to store versions of the key. 
So your current master key is the master key that when ICSF needs to recover a key, when it needs to decrypt a key that was stored uh, in the CKDS, it will use the current master key to do that. The new master key uh, register is where we build a new master key. So let's say you've, you've installed your master keys, you're up and running and everything is going fine and it's been a year and it's probably time to rotate your master keys you need to create a new master key uh, typically one of the ways you might do that is via the ICSF panels and with the panels we force you to have at least two key officers that is we have you have key officer one who enters a bit string that will be your key that's stored in the new master key register the second key officer comes in and installs another key, a, a different key part. Those two values get XORed together inside the new master key register to be your new master key. So one key officer does not know the master key value. He knows his key part. The other key officer knows his key part. It would require collusion from, of those two to, to have a breach. Inside that new master key register, we XOR those together to create your master key. You can have multiple key officers. You can have as many as you want. And just as each new key part gets added, that uh, gets XORed with what's already in the new master key register. Once you're done loading your master key into the new master key register, then to actually implement the change, you have to go through some steps. Again, we'll talk about this when we talk about master key entry. But eventually, that new master key is going to get pushed over and stored in the current master key register to be the, the then current master key. But before we put that there, we'll take the current master key and stick it in that third bucket called the old master key or the old master key register. That actually provides some one back support. Um, ICSF, when he needs to, when he pulls a key out of the repository, he has a hash that's associated with the, the master key that was used to protect it. And he'll check the hash of the current master key and say, do these match? Was this, this operational key encrypted under the current master key? And if it was, then everything goes and everything works just fine. However, if it doesn't match, ICSF is smart enough to say, wow, that's a problem. I can't use that current master key to decrypt it. Let me check in the old master key register and see if that was the master key that was used to protect this key. If it is, if that hash matches, then ICSF will say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and decrypt this key for you and let the operation proceed. He will give you a return code back to the application that said, hey, you should know that I had to use the old master key register to recover this, but it's all good and I took care of it for you. The problem you run into is if you change the master key again, now your original master key will fall out of the old key register. And if you have an operational key that is still encrypted under that really old master key that's no longer available, that operational key will no longer be of any value to you because you can't recover it from under the, the, the keys and material that's now in the current in the old master key register. If you store all of your key material in the, the ICSF repositories, the CKDS, the PKDS, and the TKDS, you won't run into any problems here as part of the master key change process. We handle all the re-encipherment and taking care of that for you. However, you do have the capability to store key material outside of the CKDS, PKDS, TKDS repositories. If you do, then you're taking on the responsibility of managing this current and old master keys to make sure that your master keys are all in. Let's go to slide 16. Uh, I have not mentioned it before, but I will now, that each Crypto Express engine can support up to 16 LPARs. What that means is if I have two Crypto Express 3s installed, I have four Crypto Express engines, 
I could assign one engine to each of 64 LPARs. Now that would mean I don't have any redundancy. I'd have each LPAR would have access to only one engine, and if that engine failed for some reason, that LPAR wouldn't have access. But I can assign the cards to multiple engines, uh, or to multiple LPARs rather. Now, when I assign a card to an LPAR, I must tell that LPAR, when you need a master key, here's the register, here's the pointer to the registers that you would use. So um, you'll see there under LPAR1 is associated with UD1 or Usage Domain 1. Usage Domain is basically just a pointer. It says when you need a master key, go to register 1 inside the secure tamper resistant boundary of the card. That's where you will find the master key that you need to use. So each LPAR, LPAR 1 through 15, that actually should be LPAR 1 through 16 since it supports 16 uh, LPARs, um, would be associated with the usage domain. This is where you get your master key. Now notice on this uh, slide that LPAR 1 has a DES master key of ABC and an RSA master key of XYZ. LPAR 4 also has the same master key value and the same RSA master key value. And the implication here is they are sharing the same repository. So over on the right, we see uh, CKDS1 and 4 and PKDS1 and 4 that are highlighted with blue and tan, which matches the blue and tan of um, LPAR1 and LPAR4. What's going on here is we maybe have a sysplex where LPAR1 and LPAR4 are running in a sysplex. So a job might run on LPAR1 today, and it might run on LPAR4 tomorrow. And if it does, it will always go to the same repository to get the key material. So I could create a key today on LPAR1, stick it in the CKDS. Next Tuesday, I could run a job on LPAR4 that uses that key. So he'll go out to the CKDS, bring that key material inside the tamper-resistant boundary, He's got to have access to the same master key that was used to create the key. So when you're loading master keys, one of the things you have to do is you will have to manually load ABC on LPAR1 and ABC on LPAR4. And load XYZ is the RSA master key on LPAR1 and then load it again on LPAR4 just so you get the master key into the set of registers associated with that domain. You cannot share a usage domain between LPARs. If you define LPAR1 as having access to usage domain 1, when you activate the LPAR, it will grab usage domain 1. If you define LPAR5 as also pointing to usage domain 1, when LPAR5 tries to activate, it's going to get an error and say, I can't get to that usage domain. Somebody else has already got it we will not let you share usage domains between LPARs. So that becomes a consideration when you're laying out your crypto infrastructure and how you're defining things. And it also has implications when you start going to DR sites in terms of where the master key material must be loaded. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about loading master keys uh, later this year. On slide 17, uh, we're going to turn our attention a little bit to some of the, uh, the management of the, the crypto coprocessors. This is a screenshot from the HMC, the hardware management uh, console. This is the um, uh, screen where we assign uh, the crypto hardware to the LPAR. So over on the right, we have the crypto number and then the candidate list and the online list. The online list defines which cryptographic devices will be brought online when the LPAR is activated. So this is for uh, the LPAR called SOSP01. Um, and the fact that uh, engine crypto number 6 and 7 have a check mark says when this LPAR is activated, if there is a crypto call processor installed in slot 6 and or slot 7, that card will be online and available to the LPAR. The candidate list, on the other hand, says if there's a card in this slot, we won't necessarily bring it online when the LPAR is activated, 
but it is eligible to be brought online at some point down the road. So let's suppose LPAR, this LPAR comes up, six and seven have cards in it, but none of the other slots do. Six and seven will be brought online. If you slap a card into slot eight a week from next Tuesday, because the candidate list doesn't have a check mark in, can, in uh, box eight, that card will not be available to the LPAR until you go back and reconfigure the LPAR, change the LPAR activation profile to add it. Now, today, well, with the Z10s and forwards, you can dynamically change the LPAR activation profile. So that's, that's a lot less critical today. But in the past, you wanted to make sure that um, basically that you checked all of the candidates to say, hey, if I ever stall a card on this uh, Keck, it will, be a, it will be a candidate to be brought online to the LPAR. Now, on the, the middle half of the screen where it talks about control domain and usage domain, the usage domain, again, is how we assign what registers where the LPAR will look for a master key. So in this case, it will look in either usage domain 1 because it's checked or usage domain 14 because it's checked. When ICSF starts, you will tell ICSF today we're going to use either usage domain 1 or usage domain 14. You could not point to usage domain 2 because it's not assigned here. The control domain is associated with the trusted key entry workstation. Uh, it has to do with the ability for a, of a TKE that's attached to LPAR, this LPAR, SOSP01, he could conceivably push key materials into other registers if the usage domain is checked. So for example, if, you, if uh, control domain 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 were checked here, then a TKE on this LPAR could push key material to usage domain 1, this one, as well as usage domain 2, 3, 4, and 5. So whatever LPARs are using that uh, those usage domains would be able to use the keys that were pushed from this LPAR. On slide 18, uh, this is a, a view screen. It's not, an up, it's not where you change the configuration, but it gives you the ability to look at the configuration. So over on the right, uh, we're, we're actually looking at the summary tab over on the right. You could look at each individual LPAR and see what's uh, defined in terms of the candidate list and the usage domain that are assigned to that particular LPAR. Or in this case, we're, kind of, we're looking at a summary chart, which just shows that SOSP01 has access to uh, crypto cards in slot 6 and 7, as does SOSP02. And SOSP01 is assigned usage domain 1 or usage domain 14, like we saw on the previous screen. Slide 19 uh, gives us the, uh, uh, a summary of what's available to the Keck. Notice down at the bottom you can see the type, whether it's configured as a coprocessor or accelerator or EP11 mode. And slide 20 is a little bit more detailed looking at the specific cards and gives you the ability to manage the cards individually. So once again, we see that they're assigned as coprocessors or accelerators or EP11 mode. The next two slides are going to talk about the view details and the crypto type configuration. But before I go there, I want to mention the zero eyes button, which gives you the ability to wipe out key materials on that particular card. So in this case, with um, card zero selected, if I, if I clicked on zero eyes, it would wipe out the key material that's installed or, in, or that is stored in the, the crypto key registers on that card. Uh, the TKE commands gives you the ability to en enable this card to support a TKE. And the UDX configuration gives you the ability to load those UDXs that we talked about earlier. Now, if I click on the view details, I get to the next slides, 21, which basically gives you a snapshot of what's loaded inside the card. Down at the bottom, the segment one, segment two, and segment three, think of that as kind of the IPL boot records for the card. 
So segment one is the initial record zero that you would load. It kind of loads some basic information. Segment two gives you a little bit more of an operating system inside the card. And then segment three is actually, in this case, the CCA code that's uh, available in the Crypto Express card. You would see something similar for the EP11 configured cards. This gives you an idea of what CCA levels you're running on the card. If we went back to the previous screen and clicked on the configuration button, we'd get to slide 22, which gives you the ability to dynamically change from the, the how the coprocessor is configured, whether it's a coprocessor, an accelerator, or an EP11 mode. If you change to an accelerator, that's a clear key device, so you do have the option of clearing the key material from the card when you change the processor to an accelerator. And slide 23 is kind of going to bring things in for a landing. Um, I showed the, the graph on the right uh, last month when we talk about this, talked about the CPAC-F hardware, and I pointed out that the CPAC-F only provides support for eight different APIs, uh, clear key encryption, decryption, and hashing. The Crypto Express card, the PCI card, supports 74 APIs, and, and this is for the latest version of ICSF, HCR77 Able 1. So you can see that the, the Crypto Express card provides significantly more functionality than the CPAC-F hardware. And that's kind of mirrored in the Venn diagram down at the uh, bottom left, which is not drawn to scale. Um, when you're configured as an accelerator, you have those three APIs, the Crypto Express uh, 4 configured as an accelerator. That's a subset of what's available on the PCI card when it's configured as co in coprocessor mode. In addition, you've got some functionality that's on the CPAC-F, and the CPAC-F and the PCI card, or the Crypto Express card, kind of overlap in a couple areas. They both provide triple DES and AES encryption but they provide it differently in how they support the key material. And then in addition, you've got PKCS 11 support, which also overlaps the crypto card. You can do AES and triple DES encryption within PKCS 11. It's just done to the PKCS 11 architecture as opposed to the CCA architecture. Slide 24 and the rest of the slides are um, some reference material. Uh, again, I'll point out the TechDocs website. If you go there and search on crypto, you'll find a bunch of articles that uh, various people have written. Uh, it kind of gives you some, some smaller articles that maybe you can handle a little bit easier to swallow little pieces as opposed to the big uh, fire hose that's with the uh, ICSF manuals. Uh, slide 25 talks about, um, provides some URLs, some links for more information about the Crypto Express uh, technology, the 4765s, uh, the Crypto Express 3s, and, and the, even the Crypto Express 2s. And slide 26 is a couple other references. It talks about, uh, FIPS 140 2 talks about the HSM and the security that's required in the cryptographic modules. Some of the FIPS standards are documented there as well. So before I open it up to questions, I will mention that back on the first page, excuse me, um, I provided my email address. Um, if you send me an email within the next five days, I will try and respond to it. But I do need to mention that uh, I will be leaving IBM next week. Uh, I was uh, part of the latest resource action. So I'm going to be moving out. I'm going to try and stay in the business. I'm going to still do uh, crypto consulting, I hope. Uh, you can certainly reach me through the guys at New Era. They will know how to get, get a hold of me. And hopefully you'll see a little bit of my presence uh, on the web before too long. And certainly uh, next month when we get together to talk about ICSF. So with that, Jerry, I've only gone over by three minutes. So I'll turn things back over to you.